Kirk. And tonight we're going to look at the first part of the wonder of God's Word. The wonder of God's Word. We're not going to get too far into the text. We're going to look at half of verse number 7. And so half of verse number 7, that's what we're going to look at. And the Bible says it's really, really pretty neat the way the Word of God is written. It's incredible. It's a great chapter. It is. Verse number 7, the Bible says in the first part of that verse, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us now work and move in our hearts and lives. I pray you'd be with those that are watching online. I pray you'd work and move in their hearts and lives. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd be with the Rouches as they're at home. Lord, I pray, dear God, that you'd help Brother Doug with his AFib. Lord, I pray you'd just calm his heart and help it to come back into rhythm. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you'd be working and moving in others that aren't here tonight as well. Just uh, be watching over and helping them and help them be here at the next appointed time. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray you bless now the preaching of your word. Fill me, use me, guide, and direct me. In Jesus' precious holy name, we pray the power of his blood we plead. Amen. Where childhood needs a standard or youth a beacon light, where sorrow sighs for comfort or weakness longs for might, bring forth the Holy Bible, the Bible, there it stands, resolving all life's problems and meeting its demands. Though sophistry conceal it, the Bible, there it stands. Though Pharisees profane it, its influence expands. It fills the world with fragrance whose sweetness never cloys. It lifts our eyes to heavens. It heightens human joys. Despised and torn in pieces by infidels decried, with thunderbolts of hatred, the haughty cynic's pride. All these have railed against it in this and other lands, yet dynasties have fallen, and still the Bible stands. To paradise a highway, the Bible, there it stands. It promises unfailing, nor grievous its commands. It points man to his Savior, the lover of his soul. Salvation is its watchword, eternity its goal. Amen. That was by James M. Gray about a hundred and some years ago. Amen. Hallelujah. And so praise the Lord. We've got an amazing book. Amen. The wonder of God's holy word. The Word of God describes itself with many different synonyms. I mean, there's just a lot of things in the Bible that, that uh, the Word of God uh, uh, describes itself with, such as a sword, such as a fire, such as a, 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 a hammer. It's just many different things the Bible describes it as. And we see that here in this passage, some of the other common names of the Word of God, we see these here in this passage. And so... Um, and uh, yet each one, speaking of the entirety of the Word of God, we see in this passage in verse number 7, we see it's called the law. We see it's called uh, the testimony. It's called the statutes. It's called uh, the commandments. It's called the fear. And it is also called the judgments. And each and every one of those terms isn't talking about necessarily a segment or a certain part of the Bible but it literally is talking about the entirety of the Word of God, each one of these words. And so, and you can call this the book of commandments. You can call this the book of the law. You can call this the book of God's testimony. You can call it all of those different things because that's exactly what it is. Amen. It's the wonderful words of life. It is the mind of God given for mankind. And so, and I'm thankful that God has given us His perfect Word. And God's Word is perfect. Yeah. I'm glad that we've got a perfect Bible. I recently had a conversation with someone on the phone about the Word of God and uh, just really uh, interesting what uh, some other preachers would say about the Bible and some of the excuses that they would use to say that the newer versions are uh, uh, supposed to be. And one of those reasons is, is because of the, uh, uh, I guess you would say, the uh, the evolving of the English language and how that it has changed over time. And, you know, the King James just isn't really relevant language-wise to our generation. But that's a lie. 
you know, just because some of the words in the Bible aren't necessarily commonly used in our language, but if you look at some of the words that they translated in some of the other language, uh, some of the other versions, like the NIV, the ESV, and the ESV seems to be the most popular today amongst the uh, the more liberal crowd of what, uh, what we would call Christianity, and uh, that's the English Standard Version, and and some of the words that they chose to use in that Bible are we don't we don't use them and and if you read them it would be the same thing you wouldn't know what they were you'd have to look those words up too and so that is just a lie just a way to try and deceive people away from the King James Bible and so thank God for the word of God amen and I'm glad that it doesn't change and that it is settled forever in heaven and earth and so anyways uh, uh, it's the perfect word of God notice with me the law of the Lord we see here the title given to God's word in the first part of verse number seven is the law. The law is referring to, in a sense, the rigidness of God's word. It's the rigidness of it. It's the exactness of it. It's the uh, perfectness, the standard of the word of God. And, and so and there's a point to this, and we'll understand, because each one of these titles also has a, a benefactor to that title. It gives a, 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 a product of what the title of that does. And so and we see this in the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And so uh, the first thing I want you to notice, number one, the attribute of the law, the attribute of the law. And the word perfect here in this passage implies two different things. And so we see the attribute of the law. What is it? Perfect. And that word perfect is talking about two different areas of perfection. And the word perfect can mean it's correct, it's right, it's without error. And so we're going to look at it, and I use the word correct because it really alliterates well with my outline. And so it's correct. It's always correct, and it's never wrong. It is without error. It is perfect in what it says. Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. And so God's way is perfect. How do we know his way? From his word. Amen. And the law of God is perfect. Another word we could use for perfect is pure. Means without um, contaminant. It's perfect. And we have a couple of verses in the Bible to talk about that. Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. You know, the Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, but it goes on to say in Proverbs chapter number 30, verse number 5, every word of it, not just as a whole, but every single word of it is pure. Every individual word of God is pure. It is perfect. Psalm 119, 140, it is correct in everything that it says. Thy word is very pure. Not just a little pure, but it is completely pure. Therefore, thy servant loveth it. Romans chapter number 7, verse number 12. Another word for perfect is holy. If you look up the word holy, you'll find one of the definitions is perfect. And it says in Romans chapter number 7, verse number 12, wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And so God's word is correct. It is perfect. 1 Timothy 1.8, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. The law of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Turn to James chapter number one. I want you to see this. Mrs. Frost used this in her text on Sunday for her message. And ever since she taught that lesson on the silhouette every, every week is now the title of her message is, you know, the silhouette. I can't get that out of my head. And so anyways, I, I, uh, I went through all of the messages online and I retitled them the silhouette. And so I'm kidding. But anyways, James chapter number one in your Bibles. Every time somebody asks me, you know, what did, did, your, what did your wife teach on Sunday? And I'm like, she taught on the silhouette. And she didn't, that was like, what, three weeks ago or something? <laughs> so anyways, James chapter number one, look at verse number 17. Oh, wait, this was Galentine, that's right. Galentine, be my Galentine. I never even heard of that before. I mean, what is that, Galentine, you know, be my girlfriend, whatever, weird. Anyways, be my Palantine. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. I think the world just likes to make up stuff, amen? 
But anyways, look at verse number 17. I love this. Every good gift and every what? Perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variable, neither shadow of turning. And so we see there's a perfect gift that came down from heaven. And what is that perfect gift? It is the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect. And the context of this really does point to that because let's keep reading. In verse number 18 of his own will begat he of uh, begat he us of his own will begat he us with the what word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures wherefore my beloved brethren let every man be swift to hear and slow slow to speak slow to wrath for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God wherefore lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and perceive with meekness the what engrafted word i mean just about every verse talks about the word of god throughout here which is able to save your souls. Amen. What's able to save your souls? The engrafted word. Amen. It, it, it doesn't just, we don't just hear it. It becomes part of us. Amen. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like Unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. It's a mirror that shows you what you really are. But whoso looketh into the what? Perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And so we see here, it's correct. This is a perfect book. The law of the Lord is perfect. There's not a single error. There's not a single fault. There's not a single mistake. There's nothing wrong with this book. We don't need a new edition. We don't need a new version. We've got everything we need right here in the King James Holy Bible. It's the perfect Word of God. It's not only correct, but it's also complete. It's also complete. Another word for perfect means complete. It means complete. It's, it's the perfect Word of God. It is the complete Word of God. Go to Revelation chapter number 22 with me. Revelation chapter number 22. You know what? I don't need an apocrypha. I don't need, hey, listen, I don't even need a strong concordance, amen? I got everything I need right here in this book. And you know what else I don't need? I don't need a Webster's 1828 Old English Dictionary, amen? I don't need that either. I got the perfect Word of God. And you know what? You want to know what the, meaning, the words mean? Look at the context in which they're written. Can I get a witness? And you can. The Bible is the best definer of its own words. And look at this now, because when you look up in Webster's 1828, does it not give you more than one definition? Well, it certainly does. And you've got to figure out, according to the context, which word is right. And so anyways, and that's the same way, with, by the way, with the Koine Greek and looking up in the Greek and all that good stuff. It's the same thing. And you know what? There is nothing I've ever seen in the Greek that I couldn't find in this King James Bible Amen. with just doing the study for it. Amen. Amen. I find people go to the Greek to teach what they want to teach from the Bible. That's what I find. And so anyways, I think this book is perfect. If you say, if you agree with me, say amen. amen. This is the perfect preserved word of God. We don't need anything else to have. Listen, study tools, great. Thankful for them, whatever. But the truth is, is we really can find what we need right out of this book. When you have the spirit of God and the word of God, I'm thinking you've got everything you need to understand the book of God. So look at this. That's exciting. Look at verse number 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall what? Add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. So it says don't add to it. In other words, we're not looking for some other revelation of God. 
We don't need some more. We don't need something else. Are you with me? This is, we don't need a, an, exactly the book of Mormons to give us more light about the Bible. We don't, we don't need to, actually, we need to burn all those. But anyways, listen, are you with me? We don't need any, we don't need to add anything to this book. This book is complete. We don't have to add, oh, well, there's some missing writings of Paul that need to be added. Well, you know, to order to really understand, we need the writings of Josephus. Do we really? I don't think so. We don't need Aristotle or, uh, how does it, it's Aristotle, right? It's, that's the way you say it, Aristotle. I think I said it wrong the other Sunday morning when I was preaching on uh, Mars Hill. But anyways, uh, uh, listen, all of these things, we don't need to add anything to it. Now let's continue to read. And if any man shall what? Take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So if we can't add to it, but not only can we not add to it, but we can't take away from it. Are you with me? And, and it's interesting to me that the ESV, the NIV, over 3,000 verses, you know, that's, a, that's a equivalent to like one of the Gospels. I mean, that is huge. They just cut a part of the Bible right out. That's a huge amount of Scripture. Take it out. This book is complete. From Genesis to Revelation, we don't need anything else, but we do need everything that's here. Amen. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. This book is complete. Amen. Amen. It is a complete, the complete Word of God. Listen, there's nothing else we need to know for this life. Everything we need to know, hey, we've got it right here in the book. Amen? This is what we trust. We sang that song, They Called Me Old Fashioned, because the only thing I accept is what come from heaven. That's the only truth I really accept. Because all of these other things out here that they try to shove as truth, listen, it's amazing how down the road years later they come to find out they were wrong and the Bible was right. Amen? And so just stick to the book. It doesn't matter what opinion, popular opinion says. It doesn't matter what culture says. It doesn't matter about any of those things. Just stick with the Bible because the Word of God is complete. The attributes of the law, hey, listen, it's a perfect book. It's correct, and it is complete. But not only the attributes of the law, but also the ability of the law. We see the ability of the law. Look at what it says. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul converting the soul. Hey, listen, there's two things that we can see from this as well. Converting the soul. In order to convert the soul, there's a couple of things that kind of got to take place. There's got to be this matter, number one, there's got to be conviction. There's got to be conviction. There has got to be, there has got to be a light bulb that turns on that says you're guilty. There's got to be something that tells you that you are in need of salvation in order to get saved. Amen? You've got to find out that you're lost. There's got to be some conviction involved. Turn over to Galatians chapter number 3 with me. Galatians chapter number 3, the law of the Lord. I like this. It's going to be good stuff right here. The law of the Lord. Galatians chapter number 3. Look at verse number 19. Verse number 19 in your Bibles. <clears throat> verse number 19. Look at what it says. Wherefore, then serveth the what? law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by, an, uh, by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, I wonder who that is. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is what? One. Is the law then against the promises of God? Is it? No. God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be what? Revealed. Now you tie this into Hebrews and Hebrews chapter number four where they heard the gospel too, but it wasn't mixed with what? Faith. So therefore it didn't profit them. But this is talking about that faith. And it was a faith that had to be, have a faith in something that was to come. 
And so we see this. And those that had that faith in what was to come, the promise of the Messiah, they were saved. And so, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our what? schoolmaster to bring us unto who? Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Can I get a witness? But after that faith is come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. Can I get a witness? Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep the law because sin is still sin. Are you with me? Now, now uh, let's go over to, uh, well, look at... Uh, yeah, let's, James chapter number 2. Go to James chapter number 2. Let's go there. Yeah, I was just going to read it, but we'll look at it. James chapter number 2. This is good stuff. James chapter number 2. I like it. James chapter number 2. <clears throat> James chapter number 2. The law is what causes conviction. It what shows us our guiltiness before God. James chapter number 2, verse number 10. If there, listen, if there's no law, there is no salvation. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. There's no salvation without the law. It's our schoolmaster unto Jesus Christ. We can't get to Christ without it. And look at this. Verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in what? One point. He is guilty of how much of it? All of it. You see, that's the thing about the Word of God. It is connected. And to break one point is to break them all. Amen? To offend in one point, you've offended all. If you offend Jesus, do you think you offend God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? Yeah, obviously. Amen? And so to offend in one point is to offend in all. Turn over to Galatians chapter number 2 with me. Galatians chapter number 2. Galatians chapter number 2. The ability of the law, its ability to convict is to show guilt. Galatians chapter number 2, look at verse number 19 with me. For I through the what? Am dead to the law that I might live unto who? But in order to live unto God, I had to through the law, what? Die. I had to die through the law in order to live through the, look at what it says. For I, through the law, am dead to the law that I might live unto God. Verse number 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in what? Vain. The law had its purpose, and has, not had, has its purpose. And that is to show us that we need Christ, is to show us of those things. And so we, we see in that passage, not only does it have, not only is the ability of the law uh, to convict, to show us our guilt, but it's also to convert. It's also to convert. And so uh, uh, go over with me, if you would, to Romans chapter number 7. Romans chapter number 7 in your Bibles. Romans chapter number 7. All the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. I love the progression that we see in Roman, or, uh, Revel, or, uh, Psalms chapter number 19. 7, 8, and 9. Verse number 7. Uh, chapter number 7. Look at verse number 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known what sin, but by the law. For the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was what? Now, what's that saying? It wasn't that we weren't sinning. It wasn't that because of that sin, but it was because we didn't have the knowledge of it. Look at this now. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto what? Death. In other words, when he came into the knowledge of the law, 
That's when he realized he was dead. That's when he realized he was a sinner. That's when he understood that he could not save himself. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it what? Slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, there's that word perfect again, and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin working death in me by the which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding what? Sinful. It's by the knowledge of the law. It's by the law that we understand sin. And because of this knowledge and because of this, that it just won't be a whole hum sin. It'll be exceeding yeah. sinful. Yeah. Yeah. And when I pray, yeah. and when I pray, for, when I pray for the people of the church, I pray that sin will be exceeding sinful. Because I want you to be so under conviction of your sin that you'll actually try to get it right. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's what we ought to do. Now look at this. This is good stuff. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under what? And then we go on to hear what Paul says. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. We used to have speed reading contest is in chapel. Do you remember that? Did you ever do that? Brother Ballard, when he would come and preach chapel, he would have us do chapter 7. He would have us speed read this fast as we could. And the person that was the fastest, you know, got something for it. Amen. And so, because this is a tongue twister. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. How did Paul figure this out? Because of the law of God. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. And bringing me into captivity to the law of what? Which is in my members. The law of sin, which is where? In my members. And if I had never recognized that, Jim Frost would never have gotten saved. The law law of the Lord is perfect. It is precise. It is condemning. It is impossible to live a perfect life in the law without Jesus Christ. Verse number 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I sometimes wonder while I'm reading this if Paul wasn't recalling his before Christ life and that question. And then when the light kicked on on the road yeah. to Damascus, yeah. he got the answer in verse number 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of what? Sin And there is that constant battle between the spiritual and the <clears throat> uh, carnal. And so we see it has the power to convert. Amen. It is. It's the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. It is what is necessary in order for conversion to take place. And we got to see the bridegroom in the previous verse. Remember? The Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see the Word of God. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Now go over to 1 Peter with me. 1 Peter. I want you to see this. 1 Peter. 1 Peter has the power to convert. We've looked at a few verses already, but I love this passage. You know, I just have to accept what the Bible says. Yes. And there's a lot of debate about this. Look at verse number 23. 
Come on. That's exactly right. For chapter number one of 1 Peter. Chapter number one of verse Peter. Verse number 23. You know the verse. There's only two passages in the Bible that point at two different things that's required for being born again. John 3.3, 3, you must be born of the Spirit. And 1 Peter 1.23, you've got to be born of the Word of God. So it's the Spirit and the Word. If you're going to worship God, it's the Spirit and the Word. If you're going to get saved, it's the Spirit and the Word. Exactly. Are you with me? Exactly. Verse number 23, being born again, not of what? Corruptible. But of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Question. Is this corrupted or not? It is incorruptible. Now, if I was holding an NIV in my hand, is it corrupted or isn't it? It's corrupted or isn't it? It's corrupted. And we're born again by the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And you know what I think? And I recently heard somebody say that people that believe this are idiots. And I was about ready to... Mm, I was ready to start sending emails and texts and phone calls. Let's put it that way. Because I, I really don't care what anybody else says. I just read what the Bible said. And I could ask any, funda any fundamental independent Baptist... Do you think the NIV is corruptible or incorruptible? It's corrupted. How about the ESV? Corrupted or incorruptible? It's corrupted. How about the RSV? Corrupted. What about the ASV? What about the, uh, the, the living word? Corrupted. What about uh, fairy tale heaven Bible version? It's corrupted, amen? They're all corrupted. They're corrupted. Listen. And I understand there's some, some other uh, uh, Bibles that are in different languages. that are. I get that. But for the English-speaking people, this book is the book. Amen. And I'm sorry. Amen, but if they don't come across this Scripture, if they don't come across the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, there's a major problem. There's a major problem. And listen to me. Listen to me. We, we wonder why we don't have revival in the United States of America and we don't see revival breaking forth in churches and everything like that. You know what we've got going on a lot of? We've got a whole lot of refreshing, remember King Saul? Yep. But not getting right. Because people will not give up their sin. People will not get right with God and divorce themselves from the things that they love so very much. Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the words, word or words, word of God. I think that incorporates the entire thing, singular as a whole. Amen? Which liveth and abideth forever. You know, when I stop and I think about people that say they got saved in a, a Billy Graham revival, mm, having a rough time with that. He was used to bring in ecumenicism into this country. He is the person that brought in, and listen, if you don't believe me, when he was a young man, just listen to his, just get on YouTube and start watching his interviews and listen to what he really believed. When they question him about, you know, the Jews and they question him about Muslims and, 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 and Buddhists and stuff like that. And, you know, did, you know, will they go to hell? And, and, no, 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 no. Or the Catholics. Let me ask you, as a fundamental independent Baptist, a Bible believer, knowing that the Pope is an antichrist, yes. knowing he's an antichrist, yes. 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 would you kneel down and give reverence to that man and kiss his hand? I would hope not, but he did, and it wasn't when he was about to die either, when he was senile, supposedly. I don't think he was senile. I think that he was just more open about what he believed. That's what I think, because if you look at his interviews, he was just more careful about the way he said things back then. 
But the truth of the matter is there's something wrong that will take somebody who gets saved that was a Jehovah's Witness in his meeting and turn them back over to the Jehovah's Witness. And he did it. He did it with the Catholics. He did it with all these different denominations. He just turned them right back over. He was not a man of God. He was a man of Satan as a tool used to bring an ecumenical movement into this country and to bring us where we are today. You know what the spirit of the age is? It's called promiscuity, permissiveness. Everything is allowed and everything is okay. And it's so much so that it's even in the church. God help us. It is a mess. It has the power to convert. But I'm here to tell you something right now. Listen, I know this is a strong statement. And, you know, everybody, listen, even in fundamental independent Baptists, people are always kind of try to walk the edge of the line instead of just, listen, is, does the Bible say corruptible or incorruptible or doesn't it? It's what it says. And so... I don't know how else to interpret that passage of Scripture. It's the truth. Well, you know, the NIV contains parts of the Word of God. It's corrupted! Amen? If you got a hold of some brownies and it had some, some rot in it, would you eat it? Any of it. Not me. Amen? We've given that illustration. If I went out in the backyard and got me some doggy stuff and baked it in just a little just a little just even just 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 a, like just this much would you eat those brownies not me amen nope it's corrupted hallelujah yeah i'm not doing it and so people can say what they want to say but the truth of the matter is is this right here i believe there's a whole lot of people that think they're saved and they're lost as a goose and they're not going to be in heaven someday. A great falling away. We're living in the age of apostasy. And I think it's a lot worse than what people realize. And man, I'm telling you right now, people just want to do what people want to do. And, they re and, and it is true. People make right what they want to make right. It converts. And last I checked... The word conversion, the word converts, converting the soul. It's changing it. What the definition says is it's changing it from one thing into another. Something that's different. It's not the same anymore. It's not what it used to be. And so the salvation that we have does change people. It does change people. And the truth of the matter is, it, it, that is the truth, Amen. and it does change people. And the sad thing is, is we just don't see a whole lot of that going on today now, do we? And the problem is, is because they're just not in the law of the Lord. Salvation changes people. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is correct, and it is complete converting the soul yes. it does convict and it does convert yes. James 1 18 of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures his creatures his creatures and his creatures ain't like Satan's creatures. Because the Bible says that before we're saved, we're the children of the devil. Though the cover is worn and the pages are torn, though the places bear traces of tears, yet more precious than gold is this book worn and old that can shatter and scatter my fears. This old book is my guide. Tis a friend by my side. It will lighten and brighten my way. And each promise I find soothing gladdens the mind as I read it and heed it each day. Yeah. To this book I will cling, of its worth I will sing, though great losses and crosses be mine. For I cannot despair, though surrounded by care, while possessing this blessing divine. Yeah. The law of the Lord is perfect. Amen.
everyone standing, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for your goodness and grace. I pray you'd work and move in our hearts and lives. I pray you'd help us to really spend time in our work, in the Bible. Lord, God, I pray you'd help us to graft it in. God, help us to be in it so that it becomes a part of us, that its words flow out of our mouth without trouble. Help it to be the thing that comes out of our heart and not the evils of this world. Lord, help us to fill our heart and mind with this book. Help us to write it on the table of our heart. Help us to put it on the... Help us to be before us, around us, and every place we go. Lord, help us to be in your word. Thank you for this wonderful, perfect, converting book. We love you, we praise you, we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray, the power of his blood we plead. Amen. If God spoke to your heart, slip your hand up. God sees his hand, you put him down. The piano's playing, you come on, let God have his way.